ですか In the world of video games, mother stands unique. Even in 1980s Japan, a country teeming with weird and wonderful games, in an industry that was only just deciding what it wanted to be, deciding what it could be, Nintendo's mother stood out. It was a strange, funny, and touching series, and over two decades, the trilogy of role playing games found enduring success at home. But, when Mother 2 was released as Earthbound in the West, it flopped. Those that took a chance on it, however, found something unique, something special. Its fans banded together in strange pockets of the internet to share their love for this doomed franchise. As the years went on, and their cries of We Want Mother were met with indifference from Nintendo, they realized that the hopes of the series might just lay with them. Starting out, like, I was mad at Nintendo. From there, it kind of morphed into resolve to kind of do things for ourselves. I think there's also an aspect of、uh, rooting for the underdog with the Mother series and not getting what you want. I think is a surprisingly powerful force. I think it kind of generates this more pure motive to get together and to、uh, make friends and to celebrate. Nintendo から、えー、マザーというタイトルで、えー、僕の、えー、葬式、えー、監督脚本というなんか大げさな、えー、触れ込みで、えー、マザーという、えー、新しいロールプレイングゲームが出ます結構入り込みますので、えー、勉強にさすがないように頑張ってください伊藤重里でした The brainchild of famous Japanese copywriter Shigesato Itoi, Mother was a turn based RPG that was intent on subverting the staples this still young genre was only just defining. The Shuzinko is a very good thing. 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 As someone who cut their creative teeth outside of the insular gaming industry, Itoi's fresh and irreverent approach gave the series its signature charm. In place of mighty warriors clad in armour, there were ten year olds in stripy tees. Fantasy lands full of dragons were swapped out for the straight roads of America and the hippies that patrolled them, and your usual arsenal of swords and axes were replaced instead with pop guns and wiffle ball bats. Itoi is, unequivocally, the voice of Mother. The series is penned primarily by him, from the overarching stories to the most insignificant blasts of dialogue and flavour text. Here, chatting to every local is just as rewarding as gaining a level up or beating a particularly tricky boss, as it's these incidental lines that people still remember years after playing. Unexpectedly funny outbursts from NPCs that brought a smile to their face, or the surprisingly touching exchanges between party members. Packed with weird humour and emotional gravitas in equal measure, Itoi's writing is, at its core, vulnerable. That vulnerability is mirrored in the protagonists of the series, 
The asthmatic Ninten occasionally has to expend a turn in battle to puff on an inhaler. Earthbound's Ness needs to phone his mum regularly, so he doesn't come down with a debilitating case of homesickness. And the incredibly reserved Lucas of Mother 3 gets hit with a game-slowing fever every time he learns a new ability, with Itoi likening these stretches of exhaustion to menstruation. Over the years, he has proven he has no problem eschewing the macho heroism the industry usually champions. Even three decades later, it's hard not to fall for that debut title, to be wowed by its ridiculously vast world, or to tear up during its most beautiful beats. Even today, it's easy to see how ahead of its time Mother was. Nintendo were so pleased with its domestic reception that they planned to bring it west. But, with the Super Nintendo looming, an impenetrable role-playing game for the aging NES felt like a tough sell. They decided to shelve the project, adamant that when Mother 2 landed on the new hardware, they would be ready to give it the English release it deserved. And that is exactly what they did. Earthbound, as it's known in the West, is a triumphant follow-up that both iterates upon and, to a curious degree, remakes Mother One. Though the cast is original, they bear a striking resemblance to Ninten and his friends, and they set out to once again collect eight melodies and bring a stop to the fearsome and utterly incomprehensible entity, Gygus. With little in the way of narrative throughline between the two games, Western fans with no knowledge of the original didn't miss a beat when it came to enjoying Earthbound. Itoi's irreverent humour and touching sentimentality made their English debut with even more laugh-out-loud moments and memorable lines, thanks to a stellar localization that preserved that delicate balance. In an age where translations were sterile at best, and meme-worthy at worst, Earthbound's localization stood as one of the greats. Carefully reworked for its new audience, it was full of thoughtful tweaks and painstaking changes that made it just as special in English as it was in Japanese. It was also packaged with the player's guide. So much more than a walkthrough, this beautiful book was full of the same sass, charm, and care that the game enjoyed. Whilst it helped many new to the genre overcome a deceptively challenging start, its clay figure illustrations and hilarious world building ensured it stuck with players long after the credits crawled. To many, the player's guide was an integral part of the Earthbound experience. But it's often seen as a reason Earthbound struggled to sell, the $10 price hike it necessitated alongside a curious ad campaign that tried to appeal to the gross-out humour of the 90s, made for an unconventional launch. Reviews of the time, however, paint a more telling picture. Called out for its childish graphics and bloodless battles, Earthbound was a game marketed explicitly for kids in an age where the pendulum was beginning to swing. As adults playing these games dealt with the raised eyebrows of the medium's detractors, they saw good old-fashioned violence as the answer to those who would call their hobby immature. Fatality. Earthbound didn't have violence. Its stars looked like they'd leapt from the funny pages of the Sunday paper. But, as anyone who has ever played Earthbound will attest, these concerns were unfounded. This game is f***ed up. This game is twisted as all hell. Itoi and company walked a unique tightrope with Earthbound. On one hand, you have a story about the power of friendship, initiated by a call to adventure from a time-travelling bug. You'll ride on the back of a goofy-looking lake monster. You'll discover a village of Mr. Saturns, the series' lovably bizarre mascot. But you'll also invade a cult who have kidnapped a young girl. 
A spirit will tear you limb from limb in exchange for power, and Earthbound's final boss has been burned forever into the memories of all who reached the game's terrifying climax. Earthbound, like any of the Mother games, refuses to be one note. Like its score of wacky, offbeat, toe-tappingly brilliant music, it's a melting pot of ideas, of themes and moods. It doesn't subscribe to such reductive age-gating. It isn't childish or adult. It's Earthbound. Earthbound never made it to European shores. On the back of its immediate failure, Nintendo made the heartbreaking but understandable decision to cancel Mother's worldwide tour just as it was beginning. Growing up in the UK, it wasn't until 1999 that I got my first glimpse of a series that would one day become a favourite. The alarms signalled a challenger approaching in Smash Bros 64. A bat-wielding urchin literally exploded onto the scene to take up one of the extremely exclusive spots in that debut roster and I distinctly remember uttering a phrase that would define my entire relationship with Earthbound for years to come. Who the hell is Ness? Ness, and later Lucas, would go on to be veterans of Smash rosters. Indeed, for many they were far better known for punching Mario in the mouth than they were their own games. They weren't the only characters battling such obscurity, but whilst Smash seemingly opened the door for games like Fire Emblem and Kid Icarus to be given a new and international lease of life, Mother was never offered that same courtesy. The Earthbound fandom wasn't a huge one, so it knew it had to be a loud one. As the next game in the series began appearing at press shows and in the pages of our magazines, the community frequently came together to let it be known. Whenever it's coming, whatever system it lands on, we want Mother 3. <laughs> After 12 years of development hell, after cancellations and reboots, Mother 3 finally landed in Japan in 2006. What had once been intended as a landmark 3D title, set to debut on Nintendo's most powerful hardware to date, the ill-fated 64DD, the finished version launched on the comparatively humble Game Boy Advance. Somewhere along the way, it had lost an entire dimension. With the benefit of hindsight, it feels timeless thanks to this concession. Early 3D has aged poorly, whilst Mother 3's pristine pixel art is as rich and beautiful today as it was 15 years ago. For a game with such a troubled road to release, Mother 3 feels unbelievably cohesive. Adventuring in the Nowhere Islands, exploring that unique world, and falling in love with its large cast, you wouldn't know it had gone through so many disparate iterations. A project plagued by grandiose but hard-to-wrangle ideas, the finished product feels defiantly focused and refreshingly streamlined. Itoi's third and final mother game feels like his most intentional. His story, desperate to be told, keeps things on track, even as its narrative descends into a mire of darkness. The innocent heart of the series thus far, the almost magical naivete of childhood that accompanied and protected Ninten, Ness and their friends, is actively disposed of in the game's opening hours. Whilst the writing is still warm and constantly emboldened by a brilliant sense of humour, that dark heart is ever-present. And yet, it's the most human of the trilogy as well, the most touching, arguably the most itoi. 
For every moment that chokes you up, a reassuring beat is never far behind. When we see our heroes lash out and give in to anger or despair, they are picked up by friends, supported by strangers, and reminded that all isn't lost. For all that strength and tyranny seems to command in the Nowhere Islands, love is quite literally your most powerful weapon against such forces. Well, I, I played Earthbound when I was a kid. I, I got it not long after it came out, and I really enjoyed it. But that wasn't really the thing that changed my life so much as uh, starting a web page about it. Reed Young founded Starmen.net in the early days of the internet. A middle schooler who simply wanted to find like-minded fans of the criminally underrated Earthbound, Young's fan site grew into a definitive beacon for the community. Ask any of Earthbound's old guard, and they'll likely cite Starmen as the place they made new friends, campaigned for Nintendo's attention, and became some of the most tenacious fans on the planet. It was also where many realised, following Mother 3's release, that if they wanted something done, they might just have to do it themselves. Clyde and I uh, kind of worked together to co-found Starman.net, you know, this, this Earthbound community. So when it became clear that Mother 3 not only was done and coming out, shortly thereafter it became clear it was also not coming to the West. I definitely remember, you know, having kind of a, a sit down like, hey, are we going to do this? Like, what do you think? And he felt pretty strongly about it. We tried to make very clear and repeatedly tried to make clear that like, if Nintendo gets involved at any point, they can shut us down. If they want a copy of the project, it's theirs for free. Like, you know, we, we are not trying to make money on this. We are, we are doing this because we want it to happen. Like we really believe in this. We want this to be available. And, you know, there was, there was never an official communication from Nintendo. And, you know, therefore we, we forged ahead. The Mother 3 fan translation is one of the most high-profile projects of its kind. Whilst many collapse under the deceptive amount of unpaid work they demand, the Mother 3 project flourished. Its craft and care surpassed even the most polished and professional translations of the industry. It was nothing short of a work of art, and with good reason. Mother has an entire base of superfans, which I haven't seen anywhere else, to be honest. The community learned to support themselves with that passion. You know, Tomato taking a chunk of his life to translate Mother 3, a text-heavy JRPG, in his spare time for free. That says a lot. Clyde Mandolin, known online as Tomato, had already made a name for himself dissecting and exploring official translations, and continues to do so in his fascinating series of books, Legends of Localization. He felt, especially, you know, given all the time and attention that he had spent over the years analyzing the way that Earthbound had been localized from Mother 2, he felt like he was kind of uniquely positioned to be the guy to help make Mother 3 happen, even if it was unofficial. Tomato and his team went above and beyond bringing Mother 3 to the West. From custom sprites to custom code, they poured unnecessary but unbelievably welcome effort into every aspect of the game, and that's before you get to the 1,000 pages of text they translated. The team could have stopped there. Could have stopped at giving the English-speaking world a chance to play one of the greatest JRPGs of its generation. I think many would have been content with such an offering, but these guys weren't. The Fangamer store was born as a part of Starmen, as a way to merchandise games Nintendo had no interest in merchandising. To get shirts and caps and badges of a forgotten property into the hands of the fans that loved it so much. We just really wanted a guidebook to accompany uh, the game in the same way that the you know Nintendo had put out the Earthbound Player's Guide. And then it was like, well, I mean, look around. Who else is going to put together a book? And obviously Nintendo's not going to do it. And so you know, it, it did feel like an obligation and something that we just really wanted to do. 
To coincide with the release of the translation, Fangamer began putting together their own beautiful companion piece to the game, a hardback, 200-page love letter to Mother 3, written not only to help you beat the game, but to help you fall for it even more. The handbook emulated the style, tone, humour, and even the clay models of the original Earthbound guide, and beyond that, the heart and soul of Itoi's writing. My own copy is a little battered now. I've cracked its spine and rifled through its pages every time I've returned to the game, and I pore over it when I can't commit to another playthrough, but want to relive just a bit of Mother 3's magic. We have Nintendo's biggest stars backstage, ready to make some big announcements. Come on, Reggie, give us Mother 3! Even Nintendo's in on the joke. Mother fans are the poor relation, begging for scraps whilst other series drown in support. Things like trying to goad Nintendo into releasing Mother 1 trying to get things out of them that they're just not give they're so reticent, they won't even tell you why they won't put it out. That's the kind of stuff that really girds a community together. And, and it's like through adversity, this Earthbound community got very strong. That strength can be seen everywhere. A community of mother fans doing what Nintendo don't. There are feature length documentaries such as Mother to Earth, a keenly observed celebration of Mother fandom that chronicles the hunt for long lost dev cartridges of Mother 1's official translation. There are entire albums of musical covers, books and zines packed with fan art barely scratch the surface of the wealth of content out there to be found. Fan animations bring to life every moment from every game, capturing the grandest of adventures to the series' tiniest beats. This ever-growing collection this monument to what it means to be a Mother fan captures snapshots of why Mother has stuck around, not just in popular culture, but in the minds of everyone who has ever been woken by a meteor strike, or used a pencil eraser to erase a pencil. And then there's the wildly ambitious world of fan games. From simple ROM hacks to all new titles, it's an exciting space to explore, Tomato's own Mother 1 release sands off that title's rough edges and allows a whole new generation of fans to enjoy its unique story, whilst games like Mother Encore seek to rebuild this experience from the ground up, bringing its visuals in line with the pixelated perfection of its successors. Mother Squared is a similar reimagining for Earthbound's Eagle Land, with big, beautiful sprite work and a musical battle system akin to Mother 3's retrofitted to the package. But, even outside of these obvious rifts on the mother formula, the landscape of gaming has been forever changed by a toy's unique voice and approach to design. He might have already declared that Mother 3 is very much the end, but it's not the end, not whilst his trilogy is still inspiring an entire industry from the inside out. You don't have to go far to see its earnest heart beating elsewhere, its strange, funny, heart-rending soul laid bare in plenty of games that sing as sweetly as a toy's kids. It's a magic I honestly can't describe. Like, a toy's worldview is so fun without it being hard to digest either. Like, he clearly appreciates the little things in life, and that shows in these games and the script and scenarios and the characters we're given. That's Maxis, an animator working on an upcoming game called Oddity. It's a title from a team of Mother fans that seem to prove the contagious power of a toy's design philosophy and narrative strength. What may have started as homage has turned into a thoughtful, touching and unique game all of its own. It's already found a passionate fanbase too with Oddity's obvious warmth and passion, pulling people in before it's even landed. ひょっとしたら僕は世の中からいなくなっても、まだ誰かはマザーのシリーズをやってると思うと、なんだかちょっと気持ち悪くて、とても
なんかちょっと嬉しいです。Years later, Mother One has seen official release on virtual consoles the world over. The same outlets that once derided Earthbound would go on to place the deceptively dark title as one of the greatest games ever made. Its timelessness, only seemingly apparent with time. The big boxes that lined bargain bins nationwide now fetch quadruple figures on auction sites. Nintendo of America's retired president, Reggie f i s a m e Is still fielding questions about whether we're going to get Mother 3. But do you think that the West will ever be able to receive Mother 3? <laughs> In 2021, the series is considered by most to be an absolute must play. In some regards, that may be too little, too late. Nintendo may never release Mother 3 to the West. But luckily, thanks to the dedication of an unbelievable fanbase, A fanbase forged in the fires of Nintendo's continued indifference. That doesn't matter. Mother has proven, over its 30 year reign as one of Nintendo's most peculiar properties, that it truly belongs to the fans. In every stripy cosplay, in every cover of Pollyanna, and in every Smash player who mains a Mother kid, they claim a little piece of it for their own. In an industry that proved inhospitable to a game as earnest as Earthbound, its earnest fans carried it confidently into the future. Ultimately, it's us. We're the ones keeping it alive long after it should have faded into obscurity. We've proven to be developers, translators, artists, and musicians. We are fans. We are family. We are mother.
Ouais, 